So we did a lot of these different projects over a couple of years and then it led to um, this current project which we started in um, early last year. And so we're halfway through, it's a 24 month project and it's funded by the Wellcome Trust, a large art award, but also by Arts Council England and the Australian Arts Council and the Australian Network for Art and Technology. And also, of course, BSMS, UCL, uh, the <coughs> Media Institute. There's quite a, we've, we've got a really good team together and also MIT Media Labs. And um, I guess after doing all these different works, it was time to start a project that we could really, or I could really get my teeth into and spend time, time with. And this project, after doing all the ones that touch the body to use, um, you know, to drive the works, there's so much, there's, there's much difficulty working like that. So I wanted to use, um, again, still emotions, but this time we used, um, we're using uh, mind reading technology, which is bas basically cameras that uh, monitor the emotional expression of the um, audience and use that to drive an empathic video. So we're looking at issues of um, how we socialise and how empathy is formed. And it's, there's a lot of questions in it, but basically when there's, there's, three, there's three parts to it. One is creating mind reading technology that looks at the emotions that we're interested in, which is, so I'm just looking at the basic emotions, which is, um, we're looking at surprise, we're looking at disgust, we're looking at sadness, we're looking at anger, we're looking at happiness, and we're looking at neutrality, I think that might be it, yeah. And um, then we're looking at um, a, creating a video engine. But the video engine is built with an emotional code, and when I say emotional code, I guess empathy is formed, I mean Hugo will tell you a lot more about this, but a lot of empathy is, is mimicry. I do this, you do that, you know, we'll start doing the same things, I'll do this, you do that. Um, we'll start dropping the same um, language, um, we'll have start having the same tonal range, we'll start making the same expressions, um, you smile, I'll smile, basically, and um, also some of the physiology of the body changes as well. But to get it beyond that, there's also an agenda when we socialise. So basically we start off and say, you know, if you're angry, I'll most likely to diffuse your angry anger, I'll be sad. And if you don't understand my sadness and you're still angry, then I'll get angry because you haven't understood that I was trying to diffuse it, so you both end up angry. So there's, a, there's, a, there's basically the trans, how we transfer the emotions between each other is what we're trying to code into the video engine. So it's not necessarily just mimicking you and doing something, oh, you see that, you know, someone's sad, I'll play this video. It's, it's working with um, a, a social neuroscientist based at um, the Wellcome, uh, the Institute of Neurology in London called Chris Frith. And so we've sat down a lot to, um, he's hypothesised, you know, how this would work. And then we've also then gone into the lab to test how that works as well. And then, of course, I've then created a video database over at the Banff Institute to make it happen. So here's a little bit about this emotional algorithm, what is called sort of closing the loop. Someone does something um, silly, um, you'll get um, angry, and then, I mean, you'll get surprised, and then you might get angry, and then you'll be like, oh, no, it's okay, and then be like, oh, okay, I'm happy, you're happy, and together we sort of walk away with um, feeling, feeling happy, you know, and I mean, I guess that's not really our goal. Our goal is for, to feel like a little bit, uh, a little bit positive sort of neutrality, I guess, that we're sort of understanding each other. And as a, collectively, as a group, we can walk away and, you know, for survival, we're all, we're all fine. So, you know, we're trying to understand how this transference sort of works. So we're hypothesising things and then testing things, and then that becomes uh, part of the video engine. So first of all, you have the mind reading technology that assesses you, and then the video engine that makes sense of that, and then triggering the appropriate video that responds to you. But to do this, you know, when I first got this um, grant, you know, you write something up and then you get it, and it's like, oh gosh, ha how do we actually do it? Um, I realised that everything had to be broken down. First, for me to really understand the opportunity that I'd been given for, to take on a two-year project and really make the most of it. 
and to also understand what is emotional contagion, what are the most uh, contagious aspects, how could we create a video engine, how do people engage with it, um, how can we test it, especially, you know, in, in also creating in stages. I guess Performs gets a, a platform that then the scientists might take one part of that and be able to use for their own research and stuff. So it's sort of a little bit modular when you approach like this. So we started off with a short film, um, basically, I think it was Adam Kendon, was it? Adam Kendon. Adam Kendon? I don't know. But anyway, so he was a um, scientist in the 60s and he basically just um, videoed people in a bar. And uh, he um, just sort of looked at the most contagious moments and how people responded to each other, you know, just having a chat very socially. So I sort of redid that in, in a studio. So I had four cameras, four people, uh, high definition, and then slowed everything down to about 10% and this has become a short film. Um, so it's sort of approached quite ethnographically. None of the time clothes have shifted. What, although it's very effective, as you see there on every head, you can see it from four different angles of exactly you know, what's going on. Everything's running at about 10% um, of its original pace. The next thing was like to grab that idea and do it live, so creating a live emotional contagion tool. So you'll be sitting down, video cameras on you, um, and then you have screens around you and it slows everything down by 10%. So you can pick up on all those micro expressions and the little things that you might have grabbed unconsciously, um, but not really, um, what's the word for it, you know, put it out there, I guess. Um, and then we have um, the third stage of the prototype. And this is when we start to really having to look at the emotional, emotional algorithm. So you've got two people and how do they communicate with each other. So if he's sad, what's she? If she's happy, what's he? And they start talking to each other. And you've got, we've put the algorithm in there, but what sort of conversation are they starting to form? And uh, so this, I guess, is all about testing the, um, testing how these algorithms worked, which meant that we had to then um, work with the human computer interaction group at UCL to actually test it, to see um, if what we were saying did actually work. This is some of the video. I'm bent. What are you thinking? What are you thinking? Like, who am I? Like a piece of fucking dirt? Oh, talk to me like that again. I'm telling you, I am so fucking sick of it. So just, um, sorry, go back to that. But just quickly, I guess with that video, that was quite an interesting thing in yourself, in itself. How do you get an emotion, if you're asking people to come in front of the camera and act out an emotional response, how do you get it one that translates onto it, a sense that it makes you feel sad, I guess has that emotional contagion to it. So I guess we started to look at the Stanislavski technique embodying emotions. And also I found a good technique was to ask um, this was all done at the BAMP Centre, so I was at a residency with probably about 30, or 30 artists or so. So I asked them to come into the studio, and they're a mix of performance artists to media artists to visual artists. And, and um, I asked them to talk in a present tense. So when they were talking about something, you know, whether it was an issue when, you know, 15 years ago or whatever, I said, you know, make out that the camera is the person that you have the issue with. So, you know, they were saying, you know, you really pissed me off when you did that and you did that. And then the great thing about that, which is a technique that I'll probably continue with the next shoot we have in Banff in June, is that it brings you in. You, all of a sudden you're the protagonist of the event. All of a sudden you're like, whoa, what did I do? I've been involved in this in some way. So for the audience, there, it sort of creates a bit of, an, a bit of an engagement there, which so far has worked well. And also with the video, you know, some of the artists, you know, the people walked in and they said, oh, this is going to, I'm going to be really, really hopeless at this. This is going to be really hard and it's going to be difficult. But the thing is, in the next minute, they were in there for two hours crying away, you know, so, and then it became quite difficult to shoot because all I wanted to do was give them a hug. Um, so it was really, that in itself was quite an interesting um, experience. But then the final place, I guess what 
you know, I'm sort of jumping ahead here a little bit, but, you know, all the screens not, will be connected. Not this time. They all get infected with their, um, really with their emotions. So if this screen is over here, it will start affecting that one over the corner. But it's the audience that drives it. Um, so to test the emotional um, video, what you had to do was basically set up a sort of Wizard of Oz um, system because a lot of the technology wasn't created. Then, so we had one person, an observer, looking at um, these video clips, and then in another room we had a rater observing the rater's face. So, and then after that we, you know, and then also the people who took part also had a had a questionnaire. Questionnaire. So we had the original code and tried to see if that actually matched matched up. What we got out of it was there was a definite engagement and also there was a sense of feeling that, um, of reflection that came up. Oh, when he was sad it made me feel about, you know, something like this, which is really, you know, also the space that I, that I want to feel. And interestingly, what they also did was attach meaning. So, you know, oh, but when the video did, when I went like that, the video went like that too. So it really is responding to me as well. So there was quite a few interesting things that came up. Um, the code needs a little bit of reworking in the results that we got back of what we hypothesised, what the emotional response would be, but that's what we're working on at the moment. I don't get it. What are you thinking? What are you thinking? So these guys are shot no, separately, but they end up having a dialogue. Like if you like. It never really looks like I am. It's all about you. Actually very it's like all about you. I'm angry because you're Daddy. angry. When you're angry, you have, have your way. Have your way. Have your way. So maybe you need to start dealing with your anger so that I can release mine then and not be experiencing this. <clears throat> because whenever I'm near you and you're really angry, I'm really angry. I get angry. And it's not my anger. It's your anger. anger. And it never really looks like I So I don't know what you actually to stop being so angry. So you can notice on the other screen, when we did the shoot, which will probably continue, we shot with um, three um, cameras at the same time, so we could easily just flick between the two. Because I was thinking about that we might want a movement sensor to move where the audience is, so it always faces them. I don't know whether we'll do that yet, because we're still at, um, we're sort of still at the beginning. Do something or else maybe we shouldn't have it's been so long I'm right now so happy to see you. You go work out your anger and I will go <laughs> <laughs> Oh, so you're so beautiful. You always were beautiful and you still are beautiful. I am so happy to see you. Mm. really have to tell you either, did I? You know, it's like that, isn't it? You just disappear, you're gone. Someone dies, they're gone. They're just gone, they're really gone. It's crazy. So it is quite interesting that, you know, you have everyone having their own dialogues, but when it brings to, when you have the sort of emotional code to bring it together, there is a, um, a sort of meaningfulness that is attached to it, and I guess that's by the code that we're developing um, with the um, video engine. <coughs> But I guess a lot of what, how you make sense of an emotion, I guess, is by context. What is the environment that you're in, is how you, um, rather than just, you know, the facial expression that you're reading. And so here I sort of tried to look at, you know, how could we get more context to, you know, what these um, people are feeling. And um, we did a, 
you know, the same emotional code was going on, but at the same time, it was looking to the web and it was grabbing a woman talking about anger and then transposing that onto the video screen itself and then the man would respond and he might be sad, so it did an instant search and grabbed some text of a man feeling sad and put that onto the web. So all of a sudden you've got this sort of second dialogue going on and a textual dialogue, I guess, going on that always was, on the again, on the threshold of, you know, making sense and it was quite interesting how you wanted it to make sense, how you sort of looked at it as a sort of... Um, as a, you know, maybe an interesting dialogue. And then here I started to look at, well, how could we deal with um, revealing the image? Because when we're feeling something, you know, to say that I am sad, I mean, it's, it's so complex because when I'm sad, I'm also a little bit angry, I'm also a little bit fearful. Do you know, there's so much stuff going on, you know, what's happening around, you know, the history. So how do you reveal an image rather than saying sad, sad, you know, which is quite, um, quite blunt in, in some sort of ways. So basically I ended up cutting up the image and each piece of the image ended up infecting itself through an emotional contagion. And um, I like what's going on here and I like this idea of revealing um, the content of the image through the actual, the image through the content of what that image is about, that um, rather than just showing it. I don't know whether that makes sense. But it doesn't work for this project because it becomes too abstract and what you want to read is something straight away. So it is something that I will take further probably in another in another project. So we sort of started with that but didn't really get to go anywhere in the end. Then we started to look at, well, if person A, if person one was feeling sad, how would that affect person 12? So emotional contagion is in groups. So once we've got the two people working together, how do we spread that out? And um, this piece was exhibited last year. And um, no, it was quite interesting to watch. It's at UCLH um, Hospital in the um, foyer, and this is some of it. This is the uh, Max engine um, that run it, and then that looks to a separate JavaScript code. And this is a, this is a little bit slow because it's just a screen capture of, the, of it actually working. And this is this is sort of they're all sitting in neutral at the moment, waiting to start ent enticing each other. But originally how I sort of envisioned this was that every, you know, each person would be on a sort of separate screen, but we don't necessarily have the, you know, that obviously creates a lot of computers and a lot of screens to run it. And this is when they start getting angry. So when you walk into this and you start hearing this dialogue all surrounding you, you start, <laughs> your heart goes up and you start to really, you know, get quite anxious. And this is some of the mind reading technology. Oh. Here. And so you can see it's latching, it, it's, this was developed and is still being developed by MIT and it's also uh, being taken over by Google. And um, it's with the effective computing group at MIT and I'm visiting artists over there. And they started this with the idea to, for, um, to work with people with autism because people with autism don't, really understand emotional expression, so they figured if they built this technology that would allow people, you know, quite, um, what's the word I'm trying to get, like put it out there, like, oh, I don't know, anyway, make it really, um, yeah, that, I don't know, anyway, it's escaped me tonight, yeah. but, um, so basically they would, you know, start to understand it and then create a learned behaviour. Oh, they're feeling this, though, so therefore I will react like this. And when I looked at this, and I, I met Raina, who's who started the 
uh, Reno Kalavi, who started developing the technology quite a few years ago. And we met in, I think, 2004 or five when she was first starting, and I was like, oh, this is really interesting. I want to do something with this. And um, they're looking more at um, sort of mind states such as, oh, I'm confused. I'm interested. You know, much of how you'd look at a computer. Do you know what I mean? Like, you know, yes, oh, they're getting frustrated now. Whereas I've asked them to look at emotions such as sadness and the six emotions that we were talking about. So it means that we've had to retrain um, the, um, the software. But also we have the issue of when you walk into a um, video exhibition, a video installation, usually it's dark. So how do we actually see people? You know, So then we've got to make sure it works in darkened um, light scenarios. And also people move around a lot, you know, so it's got to track people from about two and a half metres of distance and latch onto their face and stay with it. And um, we also have to, um, I guess, look at subtle expressions. You know, usually if you're, uh, if you're watching the television by yourself, for example, you know, scientific um, experiments have said that even if something's funny, you'll just sit there and go... But as soon as someone else walks into the room, you'll start laughing. And so this is why, I guess, you know, with all the older work that I was doing, it was always one-on-one, -on -one, you know, whereas for this, the whole thing of this project, it's a social installations and you need people in the room. So one of the reasons for that is so the mind-reading technology will actually gather a response from you. And one of the questions we asked when we were testing it in one of the earlier... Um, um, phases with the human interaction people was how was I going to, were we going to actually engage a response, you know, and I mean how much, how often do you walk into an exhibition and laugh? Um, and interestingly, out of all the people that came through, I think it was about 80% um, had um, uh, changing facial expressions and Hugo's got a few videos on, of that actually, um, not of our one but of different experiments. Um, so we are, you know, interestingly, the video that you know is showing is is creating a stimulus that we, the video engine, can use, which is really important. And so this is sort of where we we're not at this stage at the moment, but this is basically where we are: is getting the mind reading technology to work, getting it to triggering video, which we'll be showing tomorrow night at the Dana Centre in London. Um, at the Lighthouse, what we're doing in March is then looking at how we can work with up to three people and three screens. So what are the hierarchies? Who do we look at first? Who's, whose emotions override other people's emotions and why are we making these choices? Um, so it's, a, again, a time to get down and have a lot of discussion to work out you know, how, how all of these choices are being made. And um, after we go to three people, then depending on, you know, how robust it is, I guess, we might get up to, you know, five or six people, that we can monitor five or six people at the same time and use that to drive maybe eight or ten screens, depending, of course, on um, how much money we have for technology and stuff like that. But one of the parts of this project is, you know, we're looking at emotions which, you know, are often quite leaky. It's all about infecting each other and how we've set it... You know, a lot of the screens that we're using are very, are very much contained. So one of the things that I've always wanted to look at with this piece, and I'm hoping that we get to explore, and then, you know, that's why we're now here with Lighthouse, is how we can look at the sculptural implementation. So get beyond, get beyond screens a little bit. And uh, when I was in Banff last year, I met an interesting uh, French group who were working with... Um, luminescent sort of paper pixels to create screens. So it's actually a 3D screen. 3D is in you can sort of walk through it, which is really quite lovely. So what they've created is a great platform for artists to work with, but they need interesting, um, I guess, material to work with. So we're hopefully, you know, it's part of the lighthouse coming together and not in the March residency, but in June. Um, coming together and um, trying to extend this screen. One, to make it work in four directions. So in this direction, you'll see one person, that direction, that direction. But you'll also be able to walk through it as if into the mind of the installation itself, which um, I'm hoping will be really interesting. And a lot of research says that when you take away, you know, I'm shooting everything in high D, 
high definition. I, I go through, you know, terabytes of um, data, you know, doing, you know, all this database. But interestingly, you know, there's a lot of research that says you can take away a lot from an image and still read the emotional expression from it. So um, part of this will be doing tests about, you know, can we create these sort of pixelated images and still have a sense that it is a human wanting to engage with me. Um, so then we move into the final ones, which, you know, start looking at more interaction, different setups and um, stuff like that. And then maybe, you know, who knows what the final piece or if this, what, what stage now is the final piece. But we have till, I think, January 2010 to, um, you know, keep working on this. And there's many different sides to this project. One is it's just very, very interesting to bring such a great group of people together. And then there's a bit of, you know, cross-fertilisation that goes on that, you know, maybe there's something that Hugo is doing that might work with MIT that completely has nothing to do with me or... Do you know what I mean? So it's just about, you know, how you can... As an artist, I guess, I've always found... I've done a lot of different artists in residencies around the world and also in different types of institutions. And one of the main roles of that is, I think, facilitating collaborations with other people. As an artist, you tend to knock on people's doors and ask probably stupid questions that don't get asked because everyone's too scared to ask, um, you know, when you've been in that institution a long time. And you'll say, and they're working on this, and you'll say, oh, actually, the person two doors down from you is working on a very similar project. Maybe you might want to talk or whatever. So it's sort of quite an interesting um, position um, to be in and to, you know, have, have this great opportunity and, you know, great people around you to ask different questions and also the time to do it. I mean, I know two years is pretty tight, actually. I didn't think it would be, but it really is. But it's allowed us a little time for exploring dead ends, you know, that never really went anywhere. And it's also allowed us time to explore things in a step-by-step -step process. OK, we've done that. That part didn't work. Test it. That one did work. OK, so let's try this one. And sort of exhibit it, you know, a little bit along the way, which, again, is probably, you know, for an artist, a very vulnerable position because you're, you're doing stuff that is thinking through. Do you know what I mean? It's a, it's, a, it's a constant work in progress. I don't sit there and go, this is the piece. You know, this is the piece, but this is where we're going with it, you know. Um, so it, it's been really... Um, it's been really wonderful. And part of, um, I guess, oh, I don't know whether I have my um, thing on me, but we've created a blog along the way. Um, and this one, I guess because it is so, um, I've got a few blogs actually for this project. Um. <laughs> yeah, I think I just had to change this the other day, actually, so I might not be able to... Oh, oh, I think I'm in. That would be good if we were... So, we've got a blog that goes, and it's... Um, at the moment, it's secure, I guess, because basically it sort of posts all these different emails and thoughts and a lot of the mistakes that have gone along the way and sort of half trying to do this and this doesn't work and nothing's working and all the sort of frustrations that goes along with it. But it's really been fantastic because I sort of started it hoping that Helen would post to it and Hugo would post to it. And, but everyone's so busy, it's hard to remember the um, passwords to actually get on there. <laughs> but for me, I guess what I do is post a lot of the emails that um, come through and use it as to track the piece. And I, I just find that really interesting of how something starts with this idea, OK, we're going to do this, and then how the hell do you do it to end up with something that, you know, could be used for some of um, Hugo's experiments, does influence his research in some way, uh, does make Helen think about new ways of appro approaching um, curation, does make the guys over at MIT thinking about, you know, how they're creating this technology and what its uses are for and how we can create something that, you know, makes people feel more rather than um, our gadgetry. A lot of MIT stuff is sort of like gadgetsy sort of stuff. Um, so hopefully, um, 
you know, and you'll see a lot of posts there, and you know, and I, it and allows me to track, you know, what's been said and work, the great thoughts. Sometimes you have great thoughts, and you know, it's been a great, uh, you know, great sort of opportunity to sort of document that as well. So we have this, um, and then you know, this blog going at the same time, which sort of documents, and hopefully at the end, with a bit of editing, it'll probably be free for, um, you know everyone else to see and to see how these sort of relationships are formed and these collaborations work. Because one of the hardest things about doing this project, I guess, is trying to keep a collaboration going, keep people interested, keep, keep asking the right questions that interest everybody, you know, rather than just sort of taking, oh, we're doing this and this is always being open to the changes that come along the way. And at that... Um, whatever, that um, <laughs> thing. I'll pass it on to Hugo. I've been working with Hugo since um, 2005. I wonder if we should just take a couple of questions. All right. If, yeah. that, if that's all right, everybody. Has anybody got any questions? So if you haven't, I've just got one really burning one that I didn't know about. So <laughs> okay. um, you said you had to retrain the software. Yeah. And um, that, that was really... You know, so really what you're doing is you're dealing with this kind of purity of emotion. And so things like confuse, I presume those are hybrids of emotion, of different emotions. So I'm just asking you, is that purity a good way to go? Or are some of these hybrids quite good things to I think the hybrids follow? are. I mean, I guess I'm just sort of interested in these core emotions. But this was also, you know, a problem that when I started, when I did this jury piece, um, a few years ago, I created this amazing database of video, but I forgot to realise that when people talk, they're actually quite monotone, and what we're talking about is all quite boring. So the video was never seen. Like a lot of what we saw on this jewellery that triggered, you know, the, your voice triggered the database was generally um, pretty, pretty dull. But I think a lot of what neuroscientists experiments are based on is pretty bad stimuli you know you've got um, like the Ekman stuff and the uh, Karolinska um, database of emotional expression they're basically research students acting out different emotions they're pretty poor um, you know all you sort of look at in the end is that you know it doesn't <coughs> get much of an emotional Response. Whereas I think as an artist, or as my role as an artist, what I want to do is make people feel. So I know I'm, I am dealing with the core emotions and I am dealing with really a lot stronger imagery. It's very rare that you'd have conversations that were going up there. But what they do, I guess, is allow the audience to take a moment or to remind them of times when they've felt or, you know, or something like that. So I guess that's... Okay, no, yeah. that's, that's really helpful. Um, is anybody else? Just a, a quick technical question. You said that the sweat, for example, determines the video. How did it, can you say how, that, how it does that? Did you sweat so, a lot to get more clouds? Or, so, and how do you do that? Yeah, I mean, basically with that one, I mean, the thing is, is we did a couple of little experiments. One, one I think Hugo might talk about a bit more, but... Sweat is an indicator of basically um, calmness or anxiousness. Not necessarily, it won't say, ooh, sadness. You know, it won't define it. You're basically saying, oh yeah, you're pretty calm or you're pretty anxious. And it is, what's the most interesting about it, thing about it is that it's really, um, what's the word for it? It's, it, it, it's, it's fast. You know, basically someone will walk past me, it will, there will be a change in, you know, the computer will pick it up really quickly. And that, um, that immediacy is really fascinating. <coughs> it's a lie detector, yeah. And um, how I used it... How sorry, you train people not to, not to respond? I didn't train people not to sweat. I wanted people to respond. And basically, I, bas I made a, um, you know, a pretty simple and semi-ambiguous narrative that if you were anxious, it basically reflected that and the clouds would start rolling in and it'd start snowing and stormy and then you'd have to, people would work out pretty soon just with their own breath, they'd sort of end up closing their eyes really. 
take a few deep breaths, and then all of a sudden everything would start calming down, and all of a sudden, you know, there would be um, the clouds would sort of disappear, and you'd see sort of blue sky and everything. But um, it was it was always quite interesting because in the environments that I showed it, which was a lot to the neuroscientists at UCL and setting it up over at um, different spaces in UCL, you'd always have people walking in. So all of a sudden, people thought they had control of it, but then someone else would walk in and everything would just turn stormy again and, you know, you'd um, start from the very beginning. But another one of the pieces that um, Hugo asked me um, last year or the year before or the year before that, I don't know, to do a... Um, to do a database of imagery that um, that um, induced disgust, which was really interesting and very hard to create. So we had to create a lot of imagery that, you know, Red Cross line, uh, landmine victims, um, uh, a lot of people spewing up. Um, then he wanted to di differentiate between. Um, um, can you talk about this? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, essentially, the, um, there's an argument that body states of arousal aren't differentiated enough to account for the wealth of our emotional experiences and the language that, that goes with the poetry of emotion. Um, but with disgust, there seems to be different types of disgust that weren't differentiated well with, with language. It's the kind of disgust that makes you faint to the... You know, compared to the disgust that makes you vomit, to the disgust that makes you morally outraged. And, and we try to dissect out the, the body responses and the brain responses, controlling at least the disgust that makes you faint from the disgust that makes you um, vomit, or at least feel nauseous. And the problem, as, as highlighted, is, is that the stimuli that are generally used in, in experimental psychology um, are very weak and, and um, not particularly engaging. And they, you know, we're very good at controlling and measuring very small effects. But the, the advantage of interacting with um, video artists such as Tina is to produce naturalistic, powerful stimuli that really produce the, the responses that we want. And I'll, I'll show um, data from that. Can I just ask quickly about that? How you see the trying to? stimulate these responses in people, how universal are those responses? You might be able to trigger... I think this might be a good... different people react differently yeah. to different stimuli? Because you're going to talk about that, aren't you? Well, um, I mean, probably not that issue. Yes, different people react to different stimuli in, in different ways. With, within the same person, the, the um, pattern is, is generally preserved. I guess, you know, things like illness and ageing... And, and so forth will, may shift the pattern slightly, but people are quite consistent in their own patterns and their patterns of groups of people that respond in particular ways. For example, some people are prone to fainting, others aren't. Um, but nevertheless, the, the kind of specificity of, uh, of the kind of nausea response is very stomach-driven. Um, the heart response to, to bloody stimuli um, is quite specific. and. and um, people don't necessarily deal with that. Yeah, people uh, may deal with it differently or have a different constitution that uh, expresses it slightly differently. Um, there's another thing which I'm not going to talk about, but, but it seems that people's sensitivity to a lot of these stimuli, especially where it's induced by faces or, or social other people's behaviours, um, the degree to which people respond in terms of magnitude um, of their facial mimicry or, or their body responses can predict things like empathy, individual differences in, in emotional empathy that generalizes across different um, situations. And we've looked at that, and it's a growth area in the field of social neuroscience, examining the relationship between these automatic body processes and, and empathy in these interactions.